blokes are driving right past traditional Sunday church in their droves. Perhaps it's the thought of looking at the back of someone's head for an hour, or maybe it's the instant coffee. The Tear Fund's 2010 research in the UK said men made up only one-third of churchgoers. The proportion is slightly higher in the US, according to Barna Research Group. The Australian Bureau of Statistics General Social Survey showed only 20% of Aussie men are likely to affiliate with a religion. The Lifeways organisation estimates more than 70% of the boys who are raised in church will abandon it during their teens and 20s. So much for religion connecting men to pews and pulpits. Where is religio, that which reconnects us with one another and our God? In the last 10 years, the men's shed phenomenon has taken off in Australia in response to skyrocketing rates of depression and suicide amongst young Australian men. Suicide is now the 10th highest cause of death amongst young Australian blokes. The rates are three times higher than for women. In sheds around the country, blokes have come looking for friendship, commitment, purpose and help. A diverse group of Christians decided somewhere along the line that a certain Jewish carpenter would fit right in. How are you going, John? Uh, actually, I'm going really well, but um, it's been, a, been a, a, a funny couple of days, but today I actually finished employment with, uh, with a company I've been with for 28 years. This looks like a barbecue behind a suburban truck shed, where between 90 and 120 doctors, labourers, accountants, prison parolees and IT geeks get together to hear one another's stories. This looks like a backyard workshop where older fellows share skills mentoring younger men. This looks like a tent at a music festival where blokes can let their guard down and talk about anything from being a dad to struggling with porn. It all looks a bit like Luke's gospel view of missional church. The Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you, for the labourer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The evening barbecue version is called Shed Night, and the liturgy is simple. Blokes break bread rolls and share steak. Friendships are formed as stories are shared. There is no alcohol for the sake of alcoholics who are present. A couple of volunteers are interviewed with no judgment. Most men know the topics, fatherhood, sex, failure, work stress, dreams, hopes, stuff men don't usually feel safe to discuss. A place of grace is established here, and disability, mental or physical health, wealth or prestige, being cool, all count for nothing. Australian men need friends, not colleagues, not competitors, not heroes or life coaches. The Christians behind Shed Night are trusted friends who need healing just as much as everyone else. In theological terms, it's incarnational, relational evangelism. The disciples Jesus gathered and sent did not have higher level tertiary qualifications. They had not been long with Jesus. Like those disciples, the shed men are prepared to do the journey together, codependent, travelling light, as Luke describes it. But he actually prayed for them, but he stood beside me. And it wasn't just religious stuff, he actually stood beside me and he's walked with me through life, through my highs and my, and my lows, but he's actually demonstrated Christ to me. The men actually demonstrated what Christ, you know, the, you know, the, the, the body of Christ was like. So is this community? Yep. To use John Hull's terminology, this is mission-shaped. These men are experiencing the biblical injunction to walk alongside one another and with God. It is both the Micah challenge to right living and the Emmaus journey to understanding and amazing encounters.
So the, the bloke coming in may be a God bloke, he may not be a God bloke, but uh, you know, we want to talk about well, where does God fit in their life, how do they make sense of that? And they'll talk about spirituality, but it won't be in church speak, it, it will be give it from the guts, what's really going on for you, and what's that like, and where is God in that, and asking some of those hard questions. It's not clear when or where the men's shed movement began. In Australia, there have been formalised associations and networks such as Men's Sheds Australia and the Australian Men's Shed Association. It may not be possible to unearth the points at which Christians around the country began exploring this connective culture. The organic movement was already building around ideals of welcome, trust and respect. The physical and mental health benefits were already evident when Anglicans, Baptists, Uniting Church and Lutherans began engaging at the local church level to introduce spiritual health. Some denominational churches have tried to reshape the idea, like a 21st century version of the 1950s Men's Fellowship. The spectacular organic growth has been outside organised denominational church. Ian Watson, Watto, taught thousands of young men to drive trucks. He now co-hosts a national radio show, Shed Happens. Shed Happens. Yeah, well, it's my idea at church because uh, my, my thing is, is love God first and love your neighbour. And we're followers of Jesus and God's son Jesus for a bloke is the ultimate bloke in the lifestyle. And I think we've got it wrong. In in my life in the church, I reckon we've got it wrong passing on the message to men about this bloke called Jesus. You know, like, we spend a lot of time on the, on the fluffy nurture part of Jesus, but we don't get down to the gutsy directional part of who this bloke was. We don't talk enough about that because men want challenge, adventure and woman and all that sort of stuff. But we wussy... I think we've wussyized this too much of the part of G, the real Jesus. To go where Christ is not yet known, to find people of peace and accept their hospitality, has required a 180 degree shift in language and understanding. A lot of Christians will say to me, oh, has he um, said the sinner's prayer or has he uh, given his life to the Lord? Well, I never talk to men in those sort of churchy terms. I say, if you're going to use lang- uh, you're going to lose, use churchy denominational language on Sunday, that you can't walk down the street on Monday and talk to an Aussie bloke down at the workplace or whatever, then ask God for a new word that means the same that he can hear and understand. And then when you say to a man, so spill your guts, um, James 5.16, confess your sins one to another, so you may be healed. And then men goes, you mean if I get rid of this crap, I'm actually... I'm okay to go again? Yeah, you are. In the past three years, a new iteration of Shed has begun at music festivals. John's gospel image of Jesus come to pitch his tent amongst us works well for Shorty and Chad, who sling a few hay bales into a tent at Toowoomba's big music festival at Easter. For most who take leadership in this movement, there's been a reversal of the build it and they will come philosophy, church in the suburbs each Sunday morning. Like the 70, they are prepared to go to the Samaritan borderlands, where they have had to learn languages other than Christianese. And in this experience, the disciples' own lives are transformed, as much as anyone with whom they might share Jesus' good news about the kingdom of God. So often churches are monologue, you know, where the, the pastor or the priest is doing stuff, and yes, there's a response, but, but for the average Aussie bloke, that's got no meaning. So is there an assumption in this, and it's a statement of faith, that God is actually already active in these people's lives, yep. that God is already going ahead of us? We're just tapping into something here that the Holy Spirit is already up to. Yep. Um, my two neighbours, um, Red Shed runs at uh, Faith Secondary School Campus, and we've run it in the school campus particularly because it's a neutral territory. My neighbour across the road, his three boys go to the school. Okay, That's probably their only connection to church. He's not ready to come to Shed yet, but I floated the idea. But my other neighbour, who's a nominal Catholic, he's already approached me about coming to Shed. And so he goes to church for, you know, his kids' first communion and 
special things, but he's not a church goer per se. But he's he's been connected with my community of men coming to Fraser. And so when we said we're doing Red Shed, he said, oh, I'll, I'll come to that. And so there's a sense of God's already working there. God's already working in relationship. Um, and I guess the witness of living life as neighbours, uh, and we're so blessed because we get on so well with these couple of neighbours and there are no fences between us per se. I've actually spoken with guys who, um, through Watto Shed, have become Christians who will probably not go to church, you know, for whatever reason, but they experience fellowship and they experience connection, they experience communion that we would use um, in this informal setting. Shed happens at music festivals where men are mellowed out, in tractor sheds out back where they're stressed because the neighbour put a rifle in his mouth last month in industrial estates, in actual workshops where old blokes play with lathes and power tools and mentor young men, even in fast food restaurants. Stephen Hunt, John Drain, George Ritzer have all spoken about the McDonaldization of church and society, that cookie cutter effect. That doesn't seem to be the case in Shed where the context always forms a unique ministry, although red meat does seem to be mandatory. Like the offer of non-kosher food from the people of peace the disciples befriended, Christian shed blokes sometimes find themselves challenged to accept the hospitality of others, learn from their experience or skill. The risk of discovering we have the same weaknesses and struggles creates a sense of vulnerability. I saw very few clergy in any Shed Happens events. Some men reflected that's because pastors and priests don't have mates. They have accountability partners and only trust other priests and pastors with their hearts. On the other hand, the Stafford Baptist's men's shed is a large backyard workshop a few doors from the church building. It's a very big investment by the local church and the pastor is closely connected. I asked Murray Lawrence about the return on that investment. We've had a couple of... Uh, gentlemen that we can't get to come along to church or any other church function held on the premises but they're happy to come to the shed. We see it as standalone to an extent. We would like to see them come into the fellowship of the church as well but that's a long term aim. We're just happy to be able to interact with these men from around the community and to be able to bring the gospel into their lives in the way that we react with them. Noel was a guy that wasn't interested in church at all. We couldn't get him to come along to church. We, um, whenever you started to speak of spiritual things with him, the shutters came down. Unfortunately, then Noel contracted prostate cancer, and uh, it wasn't a, a great diagnosis that he had. He did uh, went up and down with the, the counts, but in the end, it became obvious that he was dying. We, of course, continued to try to share the gospel with him, but he really wasn't interested. And it was just before Christmas uh, that he ended up going into hospital seriously, sort of for the last time. And uh, myself and another guy from the shed were able to visit him regularly there and just to continue to share the gospel with him. And uh, he was a little bit more open to things. The last time I saw Noel up in hospital a couple of days before he died, was uh, he really wasn't in a position to be able to talk. He could just communicate through hand signals. But just in talking to him and with his family there, we could, you could see a peace um, in his face and in his demeanor that as we talked about uh, when he was to die, uh, you could see that he was very peaceful. So I believe that uh, he probably did make a commitment for Christ. In his last few days, when he could still talk he had worked out that he asked me to uh, Murray will do my funeral he said and Janelle from the church she'll do the catering and we'll have it here and at your church so um, for a guy who didn't like the church association necessarily um, he still felt he he'd become a part of the church community didn't attend any Sunday services but very much a part of our community Murray's response raises questions about the nature of conversion. Is there a key performance indicator measuring how many men pray the believer's prayer 
seek baptism or membership in a denomination? And for some, the answer appears to be yes, that is the ultimate goal. There are a number of people who are close to God and close to the Spirit, and the Spirit is working in them, but I would like to see a lot more. There are people you know, that are still good Christians, but I don't know that they're really filled with the Spirit as yet. It may sound cliche, but for many of these blokes, it's more about the journey and leaving the Holy Spirit to worry about the destination. I came across one shed group that had a motto, better than fine. This was a group of blokes who were interested in belonging and being open to one another. Fine was an acronym, fouled up, insecure, neurotic, exhausted. If a brother asked you, how you doing? You had to be better than fine. This was a brother who wanted to walk with you and do the journey, looking for justice, mercy and healing. The kingdom of God is like a shed where the doors are always propped open. The shed movement flips the coin over for blokes who've been burnt by a church culture that told them, behave yourself, then believe what we all believe, and then we might let you belong. Like the one who ate with sinners, Shed offers an opportunity to belong amongst men who are just as screwed up as anyone else. That's really what evangelism is. It's making yourself available and, and um, telling the story of what God's done for you. And that's what these guys are able to do. They, they might not see themselves as evangelists. They see themselves as just regular blokes. But through the teaching of the skills or just joining in or coming around and having a chat, they're able to share God in their lives to these fellows who've uh, never seen that before. You don't have to be specially trained. You just simply have to be yourself and, and show God, uh, show Christ living through you. So is shared church or could it be church? Luke's benchmark for church is followers gathered around Jesus and sent by him to express the kingdom of God. If a shed is only men gathered around a barbecue or a workbench, it doesn't measure up as a fresh, stale, or any other expression of church. If, however, some of these blokes are parts of Christ's body, connecting with others, investing time and love to grow alongside them, if this is more about incarnation than recreation, then just as iron sharpens iron and a man sharpens his friend, we'll see the transforming work of God. And that does look a lot like church.